Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, I talk with Chester County, Pennsylvania Vice Chair, Josh Maxwell. He and I have had a similar professional path, moving from being our hometown mayors to county office. We talk about the differences between the two, how main streets can stay vital, COVID response, and the future of Pennsylvania as a battleground state. Josh will restore your faith in the power of local government to respond, innovate, and do good. Enjoy. Commissioner Josh Maxwell, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is wonderful to be speaking with you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We have similar life uh, histories uh, on different sides of the country and being mayor and now on a county board of supervisors or county commission. I think the thing I'd like to start talking to you about is uh, you've been a champion throughout your career of of Main Street, of downtown, and how has your community fared through COVID, and what do you see the future of uh, downtown and Main Streets in this country? I, I think, at least where in, in my section of the world, the, the recovery has been pretty strong. With these short-term, by short-term, I mean you know, a couple of years versus a couple of decades, um, these small towns really rally around each other, and find ways to support, find gift certificates from the restaurant when the restaurant's closed. And so I've witnessed and participated in a lot of those types of initiatives. And uh, I think we were able to save a lot of small businesses, a lot of Main Street businesses. And uh, I think the federal government stepped up big time by uh, providing CARES funding and now ARP funding that allows us to make sure that no one is economically, at least hopefully, worse off from COVID than they would be otherwise. And we should be able to give everyone an opportunity to get back on their feet and, and, and keep it going. I think I think I saw the same thing in my community, both in the rallying and then the help of the uh, of PPP loans and everything else. Going forward, what do you think we can do to ensure Main Street's vitality as as the world changes, right? As shopping changes and lifestyle patterns change, how how do we keep our Main Streets vital? Well, I think we got to include the business community. Uh, a lot of these. Um, uh, areas in my town's an old paper mill town. Uh, the mill shut down. Uh, the work left, and now what used to be a paper mill is a brewery. What used to make Pepperidge Farm goldfish is a brewery, and uh, that might have a lot to do with the uh, liquor license laws in Pennsylvania. But you know the, the economy is always changing, and that's a really really good thing. And uh, I think opportunity zones have certainly brought a lot of interest. We're uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Brought a lot of interest from New York investment firms. Uh, some folks come down here to to place their money and shore up some of the main streets here. And as long as we can give, one thing that we're really focused on now is taking advantage of all these federal dollars and our own resources on the county level. Um, we're county about 500,000 people, about a $600 million budget. You know, what can we do to make sure that everyone in our county has an equal chance to start a business and succeed? Uh, we can't guarantee success, uh, but we can give everyone an opportunity here. So, We've been working with our Chambers of Commerce, believe it or not, and our uh, nonprofit community and our government stakeholders to find a way and develop programs that have people of color, women, folks from areas that maybe wouldn't have access to capital but have some really good ideas, have opportunities to flush out those those ideas and and get some support from uh, the stakeholders in our area. And that's going to be really important to these small towns, these old mill towns, these old steel towns. Uh, making sure that the people who are living there have an opportunity to grow the economy for themselves. Can you talk a little bit about the history of Chester County and this changing economy? I mean, I think it's a story that that we're all familiar with, you know, at the abstract level, unless unless you live in one of these communities. But, but talk us through, like, what it's been like during your public service of trying to 
lead this transformation and and sort of create a new economic vitality? Yeah, Chinscrain is an interesting place in that uh, it's a very old municipality. We were one of the first, we were uh, the first county or one of the first three counties in Pennsylvania, one of the first governments ever set up in this country. If you've ever seen an M. Night Shyamalan movie, you've seen Chester County. He lives here and films all his uh, movies around here, where he tend to be the backdrop of a lot of movies. I'm saying there's about five hours from my house filming something for Netflix. So, and, and Marley and Me, if, if you've seen Marley and Me, that's Chester County. It's open space, these downtowns, where my office is just two blocks from where Marley eventually, eventually loses his life at the, the veterinary clinic. Uh, that's, that's our county seat. For us, it's, you know, we live, we're, we Your don't- county has made my daughter cry uh, <laughs> numerous times. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, yeah, you see Jennifer and Aniston walking down the, sh- you know, running down the street in a wedding dress in the snow, and uh, you know the result is a movie by Garn Retriever that brings any grown man or child to tears, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry for that. But we have a great place to walk your dog. We don't touch Philadelphia. We're west of Philadelphia, uh, Delaware County is in between. We're one of the more wealthier municipalities in a per capita basis in the country, the wealthiest per capita in Pennsylvania, and I think a top thirty in the country. A lot of CEOs from Philadelphia live here. Some folks from New York, you know, just getting out, having uh, residents here outside the city, maybe outside New York City uh, for financial reasons. Uh, Vanguard is headquartered here. One of the larger, you know, financial firms in the country or in the world is here, and they're our largest employer. But then we also have, so we have the the historic main line, Villanova University, uh, just across the border, and and all that kind of wealth. And then we on the other side we have Lancaster, uh, where we have 50% of the world's mushrooms come from inside our borders uh, near Lancaster, and we have this, these old agricultural and uh, steel towns that have uh, lost that industry and are hanging in there uh, and, and doing a pretty good job. But we do still have uh, folks experiencing poverty, including uh, workers on those uh, mushroom farms who uh, come from uh, uh, Central America, and, and this is their first job experience in this country. And I think our, our county is trying to prioritize how we can help these people, focusing on making sure that the children of these agricultural workers end up having an opportunity to go to college, uh, get a good education in Northwest, which is one opportunity out of high school, which is uh, working in a, as, as a migrant agricultural worker. So we have a lot of capacity here. We're also, I think, historically uh, a county that has cared a lot about gender rights. Um, this county is both Republican for president every single year until 2016, except for 08 and LB, one of LBJ's, LBJ's re-election. So it was a Republican area forever. There are just slightly more Democrats than Republicans here now, thanks to the former president. And uh, it's kind of a lot of our gender rights. So 75% of the elected officials in this county are women. Um, <laughs> by far in the gender minority here, the electorate here cares a lot about making sure uh, women are represented in government and uh, in business. And how did you find your way into public service in this in this community that that has such uh, diversity of experience and and industries? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I'm from a town of 8,500 born and raised here, middle class town, working class town. And uh, when I was like 22, I joined the planning commission here, 23 years old, and I started. Um, the town was in the process of selling like the town park. The one everyone learned to ride the bike on, the one next to the pond where the ducks hang out, the one that you know you had your summer barbecues at. The town was in a lot of debt, maybe ten million dollars, uh, which is a lot for uh, our town, and um, they were trying to get out of it by selling this park. So I was steadfastly against it. I was the only vote against it on the planning commission. The political fix was in from the start in terms of votes. So I ran for mayor, knowing I was going to lose as a Democrat or expecting to lose as a Democrat. And we ended up winning largely because the talent didn't want the park sold. And we won by, I think, 48 votes. And the park deal ended up falling through and uh, the park's still here. So I wish I had some, you know, grandiose uh, plans to, to run the world, but really I just wanted to stop my town park from being sold. That's a pretty good, I mean, that's a pretty good story, right? Uh, I think uh, stopping the town park from uh, from being sold and maintaining community space is, uh, is a pretty good one. What, after you, after uh, you played your role in saving the park, what, what kept you in it? 
Well, we got the town out of debt. We actually paid off all of our bonds and decreased our debt by seven and a half million dollars, mostly through attrition. And we didn't anyone off. All of our employees got raises. And I just fell in love with, first off, being mayor, you, I think you would appreciate this. Being mayor of a town, your hometown, your hometown, small town, is a absolutely awesome gig. Uh, you get to walk in parades. People generally like you. You get to hang out with firefighters and police officers and, and uh, uh, really good people in the community and get to solve the problems every day. And there's no better job than that. But I really felt, I thought I was having an impact. And, and folks in the community thought it was having an impact, uh, a positive impact. And uh, uh, I just kind of fell in love with the work from there and went and got a master's degree in government. And uh, we negotiated this really big train deal for here, for our town. It's a $120 million Amtrak station and septic station in our regional rail to Philadelphia here and uh, includes an economic development project component, which is housing and probably a brewery. But it's on an infill old mill site that was dilapidated, not in the park. And it increased the return to the town in terms of uh, tax dollars by 17%. So the town won't be in any financial stress for for a few years, hopefully decades. And so uh, people just keep encouraging me to, to stay after it and I've been keeping it going ever since. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And yes, being uh, your hometown mayor is easily the best job uh, in politics, maybe a best job in the world. Where were you, Mayor? For Santa Cruz, California. Oh well, well, it's a postcard. Yeah, it was. It's a. Uh, it's a. It's you know. It's like yeah. I mean, gonna go back to the elementary school where you where you went to school and talk to kids and talk about how you were one of them, and then you, you know, find your way into the mayor's office and and what you're trying to do for the community. I mean, it's just yeah every day it was hard it's hard but every day is fun so but tell me about the transition to county government uh which i have lots of thoughts on on my transition to county government but i'd love to hear how you made that transition and and what you found once you got there a world different from running a a small town where the issues are very localized and people knocking on your door uh they need something uh, in our area uh but also you can move in from a very visible place to county government, or people really don't think about the people that run their county government all that much. They probably know who the congressperson is. They certainly know who the mayor is if they have one. But most people wouldn't know their county executive, at least in my experience, or their county elected officials, unless they're, you know, uh, getting grants from the county government or have some connection to that. So it's kind of like a step away from the public eye to some degree. But it's an opportunity, I think, with our budget and our capacity to fund, because we have such a, a wonderful tax base, to fund really cool initiatives. So I'm the youngest elected in Chester County, in Chester County government, but in, 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 on any level. So I spent my first two years just trying to uh, learn as much as I could about being effective, read as many books and things like that about county government and specifically county government in the Commonwealth like Pennsylvania, network with people who've been successful in this role before, and, and to start chipping away on the niches that I want to make happen. Um, the first one I was really successful with was a, a program we used CARES Money for where we, anyone within 200% of the poverty level who had kids, we would cover, cover their child care. And if they already had a child care subsidy, we would cover their, their end, of, uh, end of the payment, whatever they had to contribute to their child care. Just so many families here were stressed about having kids. We thought that'd be a good, really good use of our CARES dollars and it helped the hundreds of kids have someone look after them while their parents were working. And also a lot of these child cares that we found, uh, we were able to make COVID safe with grants, but also um, they were able to provide tutoring and, and things like that for these kids so they didn't fall behind in school. I think it's just I've had to learn, when, when you're, at least my experience as mayor, I could more or less do what I wanted with support of council, and I generally had that support in this kind of role. You have to be a little more diplomatic and develop, I think, a political skill that I probably hadn't had before. Yeah, I, I, it is It is two very different beasts, and generally it's low profile, except when a global pandemic hits and the counties are all of a sudden, you know, uh, instrumental in both the response and some of the restrictions. Can you talk about what, it, what it's been like to govern through a pandemic and, and a subsequent economic crisis and, and beyond? Yeah, it was scary at first, very scary. Uh, you know, you don't think in this type of work you're, you're, you're doing with trying to stop fatalities from happening and your work's going to prevent those things from happening in the work from the people in, in our case, our health department. We're one of the few counties in Pennsylvania that has a health department. So we kind of started from a good spot 
and we had we helped another county that's actually larger than us that didn't have a health department. We ran their health response as well, so that they could uh, have some type of protection. For us, it, for, at least from my experience, I remember I think March 13th was our first case, and then I think around that time the NBA started canceling games, and we decided I think late at night that we we're going to shut down the government completely. We're going to have some essential services open, 911 center, but we're sending absolutely everyone home until we knew what was going on uh, and continuing to pay people. I'm really glad that we had the capacity to do something like that, large amount of money and reserves, you know, for, 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 for situations just like this. And so uh, we were to kind of get, uh, assess the situation, uh, get some advice on how long this was going to be, and then immediately go out and start buying PPE for every firefighter, police officer, EMT, uh, teacher, anyone that would need it for the next year. So we bought two years worth of PPE in April of the pandemic, about four CARES Act got tasked and we knew that we'd be refunded for it and really got to the front of the line you know, in terms of those resources. Uh, and that was a good lesson for me in that build up the, that, that reserve, you will need it someday. And then when something like this, that could risk the lives of, of, in our case, hundreds of residents or thousands, uh, take advantage of that and get to the front of the line to get resources here. Because we weren't bidding against other counties, or we were bidding against other countries for PPE. You know, these, these trying to get masks were being decided on seaports in, in France. So uh, we were to work and get a lot of those resources out to our folks. And then uh, when the vaccines became available, widely available, we set up a couple of mass vaccination sites, got the vaccines to every nursing home here, and then uh, were able to vaccinate everyone that wanted it over over about two months to these mass vaccination sites. So um, it, was, it was a lesson in, in running an uh, emergency operation. And, and our health department, as funny and clever as they are, and they are both, uh, kind of took over what is a building and a space normally reserved for, you know, uh, 911 callers and firefighters and police officers. They get the physical space with, like, red phones and big screens with grass on it. And it ended up being run by our health department for six months. And uh, all these folks with a very different personality who were monitoring instead of, you know, uh, flood elevations, they were monitoring nursing home tests uh, on, on grass and, and the vaccination, uh, vaccines, delivery and things like that. And uh, it was really impressive to watch. And you see the capacity, not just in the government, but in people to, to care about their neighbors and uh, to put in those long hours and really have an impact. And in here, I think they certainly did. Absolutely. The same experience here, which was, you know, it's, you have this county government, everything's operating and then the pandemic hit. And, you know, that first meeting when we're talking about whether we can mass lease cold storage facilities, because our morgues simply wouldn't hold enough of the bodies that were projected to be coming at from the pandemic. It was uh, sobering to say the least while spending down reserves and standing up emergency operations. As you've responded, you know, uh, your state is a, is a swing state. And as you mentioned, it's a, it's a swing County. Did, did partisan politics come into play or were you able to, you know, focus on response without, without some of the, the noise that we saw in, uh, in other places? That was the weirdest thing about this. And I'm sure it was the same way across the country for the first six months, March to like midsummer, everyone was quote unquote, rallying around the flag. It was all about helping your neighbor and, you know, let's go get tested if we have a fever, let's do all that. And then something happened around like July here and probably in lots of other places where it became extraordinarily partisan. Masking became very partisan all of a sudden and, and, and school was coming up and everyone started to care about what the school's going to do. And, and it, we kind of left the world of logic there and, and it entered into a very, really partisan world. In our area, we are very split county, just about the even amount of Republicans and Democrats here. Uh, but every, I think 80% of our population got vaccinated within like the first two months. So everyone just wanted to be healthy here. So we were, from a public health standpoint, not have to uh, deal with partisan politics all that much. Of course, there were protests at schools that required masking by some parents. And the health department had a couple of protests. And they're, you know, okay, fine, that happens. That's happening everywhere. But then when the election came, it was probably the 2020 election coming up and people getting knowing how important Pennsylvania was going to be and how important Chester County was going to be, that uh, things kind of ramped up there. And running an election is not something I'm, to that scale I've never seen or done. Certainly mail ballots were new for the first time here. 
uh, Joe Biden living down the street in Wilmington, Delaware, about uh, just maybe five or 10 miles outside of our county, created additional attention. And um, I think uh, how partisan running an election and the outcome could be was was uh, certainly there. Every every month, some folks come to our meetings and demand a recount of 2020. And I said, they, we're not going to do that unless they recount my election, too. <laughs> uh, they are. Uh, uh, but also, it's a sense of pride, at least here. I know it was a sense of pride in Philadelphia, you know, a city that thinks it's well, I think I would argue, you know, helped start this country or did start this country. And to have the ballot count come down to Pennsylvania and Arizona and Georgia over a period of time and seeing the, the marching up and down the streets in Philadelphia, not that far from here. I think people really wanted to have that role uh, to have, uh, vote, have their votes count here. And Joe Biden ended up winning our, our county by the most ever by a Democrat, which has a lot to do with geography in Delaware. But it also has a lot to do with um, turning the page on a, what people here see as a bad Uh, four years of United States politics. What do you see as, you know, we're coming up on the midterm elections and then soon presidential elections and Pennsylvania will continue to be a key state. How do you see things on the ground there in terms of the Democratic Party and reduced polarization? Are you you seeing any hopeful signs, I guess, is my my leading question? I see more purple here. What, you know, Republican base that used to be in Chester County is now you know, Western Pennsylvania, outside Pittsburgh, you know, what used to be strong union voting blocks for Democrats in Western Pennsylvania is now left. And now we have more moderate, what were moderate conservatives in our area now voting Democrat. So, I, you know, we've seen this kind of pendulum go back and forth, but Pennsylvania, I think, is, is, is going to go pro for Joe Biden did win this con- the, the Commonwealth, despite being from here by very much. I think he won by less than Donald Trump did four years earlier. So if a uh, the state has been won by Donald Trump before. I think it's certainly in play here. We have a new dealer running for governor here, uh, the Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who is a fantastic candidate, who has a really good chance to keep the governor's mansion. I don't think a Democrat has ever been elected after a Democrat for governor here. Our legislature is Republican. So if he wins, that would be a, a real coup for the Democratic Party because it's my understanding it's never happened. And um, the Senate race is going to be really important because we have an open Senate race with Pat Toomey, our Republican senator, are retiring in a, an all-out fight to see who the Republican and Democratic nominees are. So I think Pennsylvania is going to play important in national politics. Our Senate seat is a toss-up. Our governor's race is probably a toss-up to the Republicans pick a nominee. And, um, you know, it, it's going to come down to the wire here for the foreseeable future. Wow. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope you all can do the good work to both serve your state, but also serve the rest of us that, uh, that rely on, on the swing voters in your state to determine uh, many of our national initiatives. In our final minutes here, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about climate change. And uh, you've seen some increased storms and the need to respond to those and be more resilient. Can you talk a little bit about how climate change is impacting your county and what you're doing about it? Yeah, I live in a, in a town that's at the bottom of a a watershed. So we collect a lot of water during big, stir- big storms. So for Ida, which came through our region in a very aggressive way, we got about seven inches of rain over a couple of hours, which was a 200-year storm for us. Uh, one of my neighbors passed away in the storm about two blocks from where we live, and um, uh, which is only a couple hundred yards in our small town. So this town still has a few hundred people that aren't able to, to get back into their homes and we have a FEMA disaster site, FEMA disaster site set up. Here it's, it's affecting, it means losses of life. And I think that in our moderate political area, everyone sees that, has witnessed that, uh, and wants to see change. We just adopted a climate action plan for our county. Uh, we started buying renewable recs our first year in government. Democrats took the board when, when we won two years ago for the first time ever. So we, we kind of have like this long list of things that we're trying to implement, but climate change and and uh, how we access our energy are extraordinarily important. Yeah, we're working with all of our stakeholders here to implement something that uh, lessens our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. We're, we're doing a lot of land preservation here. It's a priority here. 30% of our county is preserved open space, which is larger than the sizes of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh in total combined. Uh, we're trying to be a leader in Pennsylvania and in the country when it comes to advancing climate change goals. 
Okay, I got my last question here, which is, as we record this, you're about, by my count, about a week and a half away from running the New York Marathon <laughs> to yeah. benefit uh, uh, mental health <laughs> services for kids in your county. Can you talk a little bit about what you expect that experiment, uh, experience to be and how, you know, how does running or exercise fit into the life of a, of a person who's trying to govern during uh, multiple, multiple crises? Yeah, it could be going better. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I should have ran this morning. I didn't because it was cold and rainy here. And then I probably have to run maybe 18 miles tonight to, to, or maybe even 20 tonight. Uh, oh my God. Uh, the New York Marathon is awesome. Running any marathon is awesome. And we were able to raise some money for uh, in our area. Not to, And on a sad note, I'll transition out of it quickly, but we had a cluster of, of children we lost lives from suicide in, in this area. We had four over two months. And so we're raising money for uh, counseling services for those kids. The school districts have stepped up. The, gov- the county government has stepped up to provide uh, a tr- tremendous amount of resources to these kids. But we thought it might be a good idea to, to raise some more funds and you know, make sure that we provide as many resources as we can to, to teenagers and, and even younger in Chester County. Just one of those things I think was really important. Um, we've, had, we've had way too many vigils over the last year for kids who lost their lives to suicide and i think we have a lot we can do about it so since i was running the marathon anyway i thought uh we'd pair the two things up and and we're lucky enough to find a foundation that would handle the money at no cost and hopefully uh help some kids that's amazing that your efforts to help the kids and i wish you luck i'm not sure when uh when our lives are this hard why you're making it harder by uh, running a marathon but um (laughs) But I, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm impressed. Let me say that. I, I don't think I'm going to win. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. If you're looking <laughs> at the winners, I don't think I'm going to be in the photo. But we'll, we'll, we'll try to survive. Yeah. Well, we'll see if, uh, if you're the fastest county commissioner who runs the race. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your work. You know, I it's uh, the, those folks at the local level who are trying to serve any time, but especially in these difficult times and coming up with innovative solutions. We always appreciate it. And we appreciate uh, your role in the new deal and, and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah. Awesome. I can't wait to head to the new deal conference and appreciate the opportunity and the discussion and the uh, new deal is awesome. Proud to be a part of it. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for listening to an honorable profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.